Hi everyone, uh, my name is Adam Sturywell from Canadian Discovery and today's talk will be on the workflow to evaluate saline aquifers uh, for the proposed Calgary Region Siksika Carbon Hub. So a good place uh, to start is kind of using you know, Quest as a proxy and hopefully take some information out of that. So just as a, you know, a background for those who aren't aware, Quest is you know, a project up by Edmonton uh, kind of the prototypical CO2 injection project in Canada. Uh, you know, they're injecting approximately, you know, 1.2 MTPA. Uh, so the project should last for 30 years. The reservoir is a basal Cambrian sand. You know, we're looking at a reservoir that's around 40 meters thick with a really high net to gross ratio and excellent reservoir quality. 17% uh, total porosity on average and up to, you know, one Darcy of permeability. And just as an aside, you know, the Gen 4 simulation report that exists on Open Alberta, it's a great resource for understanding uh, injection into an aquifer and what types of phenomena we can expect to see. This is a snippet also from, you know, Open Alberta where there's a multitude of project information on this. And it, this is just really highlighting where the wells are placed in the field. You know, there's, there's townships of greater than 40 uh, meter thick reservoir in the basal Cambrian sand. So we're, we're talking about an aquifer that's very thick, very high reservoir quality. Uh, we think it's very, or sorry, Shell thinks it's very laterally continuous and you know it's an excellent target for sequestration. So a big takeaway out of here, you know, for us and you know what we use in our workflow going forward is how big can a plume get? So contained in that simulation report uh, there's a multitude of simulations that have been run in scenarios. Uh, and the point kind of here that I'd like to draw everyone's attention to is, you know, on a three well injection case or injecting, you know, 9 million tons of CO2 per well, you know, we're looking on the high end of a plume that could be seven kilometers in length. So, you know, call it three miles, two and a half, whatever the case may be uh, in each direction per well. Uh, you know, the plumes start getting pretty big. And this is the P90 scenario, you know, the P50 is less, uh, but this just, you know, gives us a flavor for how much volume of rock do we need to see uh, in an aquifer if we're going to be evaluating it for sequestration of CO2. So, you know, takeaways from here and, and you know, in kind of a comparison, if we were to inject that same volume into a reservoir that's maybe only 10 meters thick, how big would that plume be? Is it 4x? Are we now suddenly looking at a plume that could be 28 kilometers in length or you know, perhaps larger? Uh, what if we're injecting five times the volume of CO2 or even more? Uh, does the plume size affect surface facility designs, things like pipelines, compression, all those types of things? Uh, the MMV, what influence on the monitoring of the project will there be depending on plume size? You know, CO2, or pardon me, for seismic, do we need to shoot new 3D? Uh, how big of an area do we need to look at? And then, you know, just risk questions. What if we need to look at multiple aquifers and what do we do if we pressure out a zone? These are all, you know, the, the questions that we ask ourselves when we go into this type of work. So what is the Calgary Siksika CCUS project? Well, it's a project that's being proposed by Reconciliation Energy Transition Inc, uh, which is a, an entity within Project Reconciliation uh, and partnered with the Siksika First Nation. The project is aiming to sequester five MTPA uh, per year. So, you know, just over four times what the Shell Quest project is. It's targeting a 40 year uh, project lifespan uh, we're going to give an overview on, you know, multiple, multiple aquifer sequestration targets, uh, why we think that's important in here. And, you know, just as a highlight, there will be multiple sources of CO2. So it's not going to be from one facility. These uh, facilities are going to need to be tied together. There's going to be material field development, compression, pipelines that go in place, and that's going to affect this project. So assumptions for us, you know, kind of at the front end, you know, we're using a back of the napkin number of a million and a half dollars Canadian per kilometer of new pipeline. So, you know, we're trying to find sequestration targets that are the shortest pipeline routes from the major emission facilities. 
uh, that ties directly in with compression. Uh, you know, simple pipe, short pipe are, are definitely economic benefits. Uh, we'd like to minimize well locations, plume size, and those facilities design considerations. And really for us, you know, how can we find a sequestration target that can store up to five times the volume of quest in areas where the reservoir quality may not be quite as good? And we'll discuss, you know, this coming up, but the lack of deep penetrations in here really, you know, increase the risk in understanding the deep uh, aquifer targets. So what's our process? Uh, we kind of go through, you know, three stages or, you know, as, as we're looking at these projects, this presentation is really going to be focused on what we call stage one screening. So initial scoping of resource and making sure it fits the average criteria. Uh, after that, we go to, you know, parametric modeling, analytical modeling and analogy models. We want to make, you know, estimates on how big might a plume be through simple models, uh, injection pressures, injection rates per well. And then, you know, finally, we know we need to end up at a, a detailed geologic model and a, a much more robust flow simulation to understand uh, plume size and migration. So that stage one workflow, we're talking about what, what is that and what do we mean by that? So the things that we're looking at are really an in tandem geologic investigation uh, done at the same time as a hydrogeologic investigation. So for geology, we're looking at you know, area, thickness, porosity, permeability, while at the same time trying to understand the hydrogeologic components. So that's pressure and temperature, uh, so we can make robust estimates on CO2 phase and density. This allows us, you know, to determine potential storage volumes and, you know, ultimately get good handles on storage volumes and injectivities in the areas of interest for us. Uh, our thought process is that we can, you know, carry these two things out uh, simultaneously uh, to try and arrive at good estimates of storage volumes rather quickly. And, you know, we use kind of the preferred criteria on the right is really the starting points for what types of reservoirs are we looking at? Uh, what are the pressures, porosities, permeabilities, and thickness? But these we're, we're finding are guideposts, and there's reasons we may need to look at reservoirs outside of, you know, some of these criteria as we move forward. For example, the 20 meter thick reservoir may not be, you know, a hard and fast rule of thumb depending upon the project. So what is the geologic evaluation? Uh, you know, this, the maps on here come from uh, Bachu in 2015, you know, but they do a really good job of interesting, in, of highlighting what we're trying to find. So we're looking at depth, thickness, porosity uh, of the reservoirs. We want to make sure the targets are greater than 1,000 meters uh, and, you know, just start being able to high grade areas with very high storage volumes as they're likely going to be our best targets. We also want to make sure, you know, as early as possible that we can detect things like faulting or fracturing as those propose seal risks to the project. The hydrologic, or sorry, hydrogeological evaluation, uh, you know, we're looking at pressure, temperature, CO2 properties. So relatively straightforward. Uh, you know, again, we need these in order to estimate how much volume may exist. So that can be everything from pressure, DSTs, figuring out pressure elevation plots, understanding salinity and distribution of fluids, and really just trying to understand if each one of these aquifers are, are they contained or are they, is there cross flow between them? And where are our areas where we may be concerned about containment? So that's you know the the workflow in a nutshell. If we if we focus in on our project area, uh, you know we know that we're going to be needing to look at predominantly the Paleozoic in the study area of interest east of Calgary. Uh, so that basically takes us from the Beloit down. Uh, there's lots of good regional seals in here, uh, so we're going to make sure we highlight those. And you know just one comment on the basal Cambrian sands in that. It exists here. Uh, there's very few penetrations and it makes it very hard to understand the quality of rock that exists. So a lot of this work is really deleveraging the project to find other potential aquifers uh, that can provide you know, viable storage opportunities 
if, for example, you know, the Cambrian sands are tight or it may not have the pore volume we expect or whatever the case may be. And the stratigraphic chart on the right, each individual you know, dot on here are the potential aquifers that exist in the area. So, you know, we have the basal Cambrian sands, Beaver Hill Lake, Leduc, Nisku, Stetler, uh, Blue Ridge, uh, all the way up into, you know, the Beloit. So there are, there are multiple uh, aquifers in here that we could consider. And again, you know, just back to that point that this is a five MTPA project that we're looking here. So we need a big pore volume and we need thickness in order to ensure the project can be successful. Data distribution. Uh, so this, this comes out of the Petrel model, but just as a snapshot, if we start on the bottom right, you know, in Calgary is approximately where my mouse is now, um, we're looking at very few penetrations down to the basal Cambrian sands. We have seven. In the Beaver Hill Lake, we have just about 250. And as we work up into the Leduc, Nisku, and Colorado, our in some areas, our data quality gets, or data density gets quite good, but even in cases, you know, down here, southeast of, you know, Entice and kind of in that area, there's still very few penetrations in here. So we're trying to do as good of a job as we can at understanding regional distribution of rocks in areas where we may have relatively low amounts of data. So, you know, looking beyond the basal Cambrian sands, uh, you know, it's important for us to consider other reservoirs than that. And, you know, the BCS, it's challenging. What is the regional distribution of reservoir facies, properties? Do we think uh, that this reservoir is going to be like the Quest project in a 17% one Darcy perm uh, type range? Uh, we would suggest likely not. So we know that, you know, redundancy becomes important. Um, so, you know, understanding this and, and having redundant targets is, is important in a project of this size. So given that there's so many potential aquifers, we kind of have to go through a, a quick and dirty analysis of each one and high grade the ones we think that require a more in-depth analysis. Uh, so in the case here, we're going to go kind of quickly through the Turner Valley Elkton unit in the Calgary area and kind of highlight why it might not be a good candidate for sequestration, even though it's it's truly a, an amazing reservoir. So just as far as data distribution uh, on this map, if we have Calgary up in this area, this is the Turner Valley field, and then we have a type log here. And what this map is showing us is, you know, DST's production, um, you know, where the zero edge is uh, from the Turner Valley. And the big points here are, there is production kind of scattered all throughout the area and that that becomes a very large concern is that production going to limit our potential to secure this as a sequestration target what are the impacts with things like containment abandonments those types of things so you know that, that is a material risk if we look at the reservoir in this type log from 13 13 2027 you know this core is from the very top of it but you know, we're looking at 10 to greater than 20% uh, porosity. We're looking at, you know, 10 to 30 millidarcies of perm. And just, you know, a rough overview of the logs, we likely have greater than, you know, 30 meters of reservoir here at, at greater than 10% porosity. So it's a quite thick aquifer. Uh, it's got quite good permeability. We know it's regionally extensive from multiple penetrations in the area. Uh, but there's risk. Uh, there's risks in the seal. Uh, we know that there's multiple penetrations and abandonments, so we don't know how good those are. We do not understand yet or have a line of sight to what that production or associated production is going to look like in terms of the regulatory and getting approval uh, for this as a sequestration target. And there is some H2S. So our choice here was to say that this is, you know, in comparison to other aquifers in the area, not a good target. So we, we've gone through that process essentially for every one of these aquifer units here. Uh, you know, we've done scoping mapping, regional cross sections, understand that reservoir and structure, uh, separated them out from those that, you know, failed the scoping workflow. So just like the Elkton Turner Valley to the ones that passed scoping. And then from that, you know, we're looking at detailed facies and that reservoir mapping core analysis to understand porosity perm, 
perm is an interesting one. You know, we're we're all we're using that kind of as a baseline, but we're also making sure that we're looking at other permeability sources like buildups or you know whatever the case may be to a further illuminate true reservoir permeability. This is the hydrogeology, the petrophysics analysis, and then under to understand the reservoir volumetric capacity. So how much can it hold? As far as the hydrogeologic evaluation, this is a, also a big component and we want to make sure that these aquifers are in containment. And if we you know, just look at every DST that exists in the study area, this is the chart on the left shows all of them. And if we highlight this area in the middle, we know that there are areas here where we're starting to see uh, aquifers talking to one another. And one of the things that we're not sure of or we want to make sure is that if they're talking to one another, that they're under a, a very extensive regional seal, or in an even better case, if we can find specific you know, units where we can get to an area like this where they're on individual pressure uh, elevation gradients or pressure gradients, we can make reasonable assumptions that there is good containment within the reservoir unit. Uh, data, you know, this is another big component of this work, especially in the Paleozoic and the carbonates, is we kind of have to take a step back and look at, you know, the well level and then go down to, you know, the petrographic and true nuts and bolts geology level. One of the things that we're concerned with, especially in the carbonates, is are we looking at rocks that they are regionally extensive in terms of porosity and flow unit distribution? Um, what are the facies types? Porosity is important, you know, there's bug, buggy porosity is going to be a very different value to us than something like, a, you know, microsacrosic texture or something like that in the carbonate. So we just want to make sure that porosity distribution is understood and that we're recommending aquifers that are regionally continuous. As far as the basal Cambrian sand with so few, so few penetrations, one of the things that we've had to look at is going and looking at the cutting. So, you know, we've had cuttings, you know, thin sections made. What is the mineralogy? What types of porosity can we expect? What are the pore geometries in it? Do we see things, you know, like cements that may, you know, affect permeability through time? And this information can be really used to, to guide what we see in often, you know, quite old or vintage, you know, petrophysics in order to understand what's going on. So once we've kind of gone through all these in this area at least, or the area specifically in this target where we're looking at field development, you know, we kind of have four high level aquifers that are quite good candidates as far as being regionally extensive, uh, you know, having good containment within them and, you know, just being suitable as far as pressure and temperature regimes. So in that case, we're looking at the Basal Cambrian Sands, the Beaver Hill Lake, uh, the Niskew or the, and the Lower Leduc as being the principal targets without, within this area. And here we just, you know, have a hydrostratigraphic chart where we're kind of showing the different aquitard systems that exist in here as well. So as far as an area of interest map and what that looks like after you go through the process, each one of these ellipses approximates, you know, the, the rough aerial distribution of the better quality uh, aquifers that exist in this area. So there are many choices from here once you have this information. Where do you want to start developing a field? Where do you want to plan a well, plan things like further testing? Uh, start looking at seismic and how do you guide developing this project from here? So the next steps, you know, I think the next steps for everyone in the space is, you know, the Alberta Energy RFP. Uh, is that in December 2021? We're not sure. Uh, where we know we're going to need to drill a well or many uh, new logs, new core injection drawdown tests, uh, seismic uh, and plume size modeling. We kind of need to arrive at that relatively soon. And finally, just to close up, you know, it's, it's risk and, you know, projects have risk. The big risk here is that any one of these aquifers that we're mapping uh, may not be continuous. Uh, it may not be able to support the injection volumes we're looking at. Uh, it may not have the permeability or flow capacity that's required. So we feel, you know, understanding more of the stratigraphic column becomes important 
uh, and having secondary targets and a plan to assess them throughout the life of a project is very important. So that's, the Cal that's where we are with the Calgary Siksika CCUS hub, uh, you know, initial scoping workflow, and we're looking forward to any questions. Thank you.